a guy walks into LaGuardia, he's flying to Denver. And he goes to the ticket counter. The ticket counter says, what flight are you checking for? So I'm flying to Denver. Do you have any bags to check? He says, yeah, I do. But before I check my bags, I want to know something. The big bag here, can you make it show up tomorrow in Dallas? And the two medium bags, can you, mo can you make them show up three days from now in Cincinnati? The, the guy at the, the, the desk, he says, no, sir, we cannot do that. He says, are, are you sure you can't do it? He says, no, sir, we, we, I'm, I'm, come on, you're flying from LaGuardia to Denver to make one bag f show up tomorrow in Dallas and, and two bags show up three days from now in Cincinnati? No, we can't do that. He says, are you sure you can't do it? He says, no, we cannot do it. He says, good, because that's exactly what you guys did to me last time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Speaking of itineraries, multi-city itineraries. This week, Yakir Vesov, the final confrontation. And Asov makes peace with Yaakov. And he says to him, brother, now that we made peace, let's become traveling partners. Let's go travel together. And Yaakov tells Asov, Yavr no adeni lifne avde. My master, please pass before your servant. Meaning, go on ahead, go on without me. Va'ani isnahalo li'iti. I'll take my time, according to my pace. L'regla malocha she l'fanai. L'regla yolodim. According to the pace of the, all the animals that I have with me, as well as the pace of the children. I have children with me, it slows me down. Ad asher ove, until I come. El adoini, to my master, meaning to you, to Esav. Seira, Seira, to the mountain of Seir. So I'll meet up with you. Just go on ahead, and we'll meet up at Har Seir. Okay. Now, if you go on and you read, Yankiv travels, and he goes to Sukkot, and then he goes to Shem, and then uh, I mean, if you keep following, eventually he goes to Hebron. He never shows up in Seir. So Rashi deals with this. Rashi says, what, what was Yaakov telling Yasef? Until I meet up with my master in Seir. He widened, or he expanded, he expanded the way for him. What does that mean? <coughs> it means he described his itinerary by projecting the trajectory farther than he actually was going. He only had in mind to go to Sukkais. So Sukkais was in that general direction, but instead of saying, meet me at Sukkais, meet me at Seir, which is much farther past Sukkais. Why did he do that? Omer, he said, he said to himself, Yaakov said to himself, Im if he has in mind to do harm to me, my brother Esav, even though we just made peace, but he established himself as a, as a violent person. Yamtin, he will wait over there at Seir, where I told him to wait up for me. Adbai atzle, till I arrive to him, till I get there. So he won't be able to ambush me. Vuhu halach, and then he didn't go. Yaakov didn't go. Now, what do you do about the fact that this is clearly misleading? Rashi doesn't like that. He doesn't like for us to think that Yankiv is misleading. So Rashi tells us, When will he go? He wasn't lying. He said, I'll meet you there eventually. Right? It's like when your wife says, I'll be ready in five minutes. Right? Okay. <laughs> By the way, they say that a woman's I'll be ready in five minutes is roughly equivalent to a man's I'll be home in five minutes. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So you can use that for free. You don't even have to quote me. All right. So when will he reach there? Bimei Mashiach. In the times of Mashiach. 
Shinama, like it says, and we're going to quote now from Evadya. Evadya was an interesting prophet. He was a Ger Tzedek, a righteous convert from Edoim. Edoim means the Roman people who descend from Esau. Yeah, he was a descendant of Esau, and because he became a Jew, he merited in his prophecy, when he became a prophet, to prophesize the downfall of his people of his biological origin. Yeah. And the Haftorah for this week is the book of Avadya. <coughs> so Avadya said, and in fact it should be familiar to you because we say it, well you'll tell me when we say it. Avadya said regarding his prediction or his prophecy of the, of the messianic era, messianic showdown between Yankiv and Esau, Shinema, like it says, La'alu me'shiim bahar tziyein. Saviors will go up upon Mount Zion, that means the Jewish people. Lishpite, to judge for all that they did over the millennia, as har esav, the mountain of esav, which is synonymous with har seir. When do we say that, by the way? La'alu me'shiim bahar tziyein, lishpite as har esav. And Hashem will have the kingship. It's, uh, we say it every single day in Davani. Yeah. At the end of Pesukah uh, Yeah. Okay. So I want to tell you, this is more than just a narrative. This story. As we know, Torah is Malash and Heira. The word Torah itself is from the word Heira, which means instruction. So everything in Torah is instructive. It's not just a history. And indeed, our sages derive a halacha from this story. It is brought in the Gemara, Nevedah Zoda, Daf Chof Hei Omid Beis. And it is codified by the Rambam in Mishnah Torah, Hilchus Reitzeach, Laws of Murderers, Pedic uh, Yud Beis, Halacha Ches, if you're interested to look it up. And it says there that if a Jew is asked by a non Jew, hey, where are you going? He shouldn't tell him where he's going because the non Jew may lay, lie in ambush and wait for him. So he should do it like Yaakov told Esav and say, a further destination. So if he's starting off in five towns, and he's heading to Brooklyn. And the non Jew says, Where are you going? He says, I'm going to New Jersey. So the non Jew is going to be waiting all the way down there in New Jersey. And the Jew will never get to that point because he was only going to Brooklyn. And then he won't get ambushed. That's what the halacha is. Now, I want to tell you something. You're going to say, Well, why don't, why don't we do that? You know why we don't do that? Because that's not the way people are today. People are not lawless. People are not murderers. And in our day and age, not only just in our day and age, but for centuries, I'm, saying, I'm not saying this to be PC. I'm, the, the, the halachic commentaries say, specifically the Me'iri, who lived in 13th century Spain, he already said, you don't have to speak that way to non-Jews. They're not lawless people. They're not suspected of murder. I mean, even if they don't like you, they're not going to just murder you. So we don't actually do it that way anymore. We don't do that. You can actually tell them, I'm going to Brooklyn. So, <clears throat> it's good to know that you don't have to, because uh, imagine at the ticket counter. By the way, that's why the Jews buy the Hidden City tickets, by the way, that's just so you know, point beyond destination. That's a little like Dan Steele's joke there, but inside baseball. Okay, for whoever gets the joke. At any rate, you go, you go research it. At any, <laughs> at any rate, <laughs> you're flying to Miami, you, say, you bring your passport, say you're going to Bermuda, it's a lot cheaper. Okay, at any rate, I can't give all the secrets here, this is a sheer. Anyways, um, so we don't do this today. You can tell a non-Jew your real destination. You don't have to be worried that they're going to kill you. So then the question becomes, and this question only arises from a deep conviction that everything in the Torah is instructive. The question becomes, okay, fine, so then what is the teaching for us? 
It's not just a factoid. It's not just, hey, you want to know some trivia? Once upon a time, non-Jews were so lawless that you had to be afraid they were going to kill you and you couldn't tell them where you were really going. Okay, that's trivia. That's historical in information. But Torah is Torah. Torah is instruction. So I want to know, for us, in 2019, what is the practical guidance that we can still glean from this, from this uh, halacha? Okay, so put that on the shelf, and I want to tell you a story. The story takes place in 1991 in Moscow. This is Gorbachev's Soviet Union. This is the times of perestroika, when things are just beginning to thaw. And there was a, a thought, well, I, I suppose I should back up. Um, there's such a thing as the Kines Hashluchim Ha'ilami, the global or the worldwide convention of Chabad emissaries, which takes place in New York, just took place a few weeks ago. And then there are regional kinosim. There are regional gatherings of shluchim, of Chabad shluchim. In, uh, in America, they take place according to, to different regions. Uh, but in other countries, some, you know, other countries are smaller. So you can have, they have an, an entire European uh, regional uh, kinos. So in 1991, there was a thought in the America's offices, America's Linyoni Chinuch, that's the organization one of the main organizations of Chabad and the one that runs the, uh, the Shlichas. So there was a thought that now that Russia's opening up a little bit, maybe we'll make the European regional kinos in Russia. Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be cool? I mean, just decades earlier, not even decades earlier, even, even years earlier, there was oppression of Judaism, but you didn't have to go back you know, too far, you know, even just a few decades, where literally these same chassidim or this same movement was being targeted for the most brutal torture and, 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 and summary executions and like people being dragged out in the street and murdered for teaching, for teaching children Torah, right? And now, just a few years later, it was possible, you know, we could make, we could make the European regional convention in, in Moscow. So the Rebbe was asked whether or not this would be okay. So the Rebbe's response was, if all of the shluchim can get visas, then it's good. That was the Rebbe's response. If all of the shluchim can get visas. And that's what happened. All of the, all of the European shluchim were able to get visas into Russia. And it was arranged that the, the European regional kinnis should be in Moscow. And the, the regional kinnis was, was, was arranged or directed by Rabbi uh, Moshe Katlarski, who's the one who arranges the main kinnis as well as all of the regional kinnosim. And uh, Rabbi Katlarski figures prominently as a character in this story, as you're going to see. Shabbos, they're in the, I hope I'm pronouncing this, not butchering this too bad, but it's called the Moladishnaya Hotel in Moscow. Fancy hotel. And they're supposed to go down to the Marina Rasha Shul, which was the one of the one shuls that stayed open under communism, prominent shul. And that Shabbos morning, all of a sudden, there's pounding, furious banging at Rabbi Kotlarski's hotel door. He opens the door, and one of the shluchim says to him, you're in trouble. They're going to kill you. He says, who? Who's going to kill me? He says, the old men, the old men are going to kill you. He says, what old men? He says, the old men, they say you walk them into a trap. What's going on? So he goes downstairs, he leaves his room, and goes downstairs, and he finds three senior shluchim. Okay, I happen to know who it was. It was uh, Helka Pevzna, Shlema Matasov, and, and Berogarevich. They're hiding in a broom closet. And they see Reb Moshe, and they mo motion to him. They pull him into the broom closet, and, and, and they, they say to him, how did you do this to us? How could you do this to us? 
Reb Meisha said, do what? What did I do? You walked us into a trap. We're all going to be exiled. We're all going to be killed. We're all going to be arrested, at the very least. Now, you have to understand something. All three of these senior shluchim grew up in Soviet Russia. All three of them had been arrested, had served time, had been in prison. Indeed, Shlomo Matasov was arrested from the steps of Marina Rosh Hashul, the very shul that they were about to walk to that Shabbos morning. So they had definite reason to be insecure. They grew up, this is where they lived, this is where they were persecuted. The memories were not that old, it was their lifetime. And now, what did they see, which triggered all of this panic, this dread, this trauma? They said, look, look outside. You say we're not in a trap, look outside, look what you did to us. So the Meisha goes to the window and he sees a whole row, a whole row of Russian police. Ramesha walks back over to the three elder Siddham and he says, it's an honor guard. They're going to escort us when we walk to shul. The three elder Siddham said, it's impossible, there's no such thing. There's no such thing. Ramesha says, okay, I'll tell you what. I'll go out first. If they take anyone, they'll take me. And while they're grabbing me, everyone else can scatter. So they say, fine, you know. That's what you're willing to do. So the Misha goes out, speaks to the police, turns around, comes back in, he says, I told you guys, it's an honor guard. They're here to escort us, police escort, as we walk to shul. And that is indeed what happened. There was a parade, so to speak, of shluchim, Shabbos morning in Moscow, in their kapotas, with their talesaman over their shoulders, marching proudly down the street, Russian police escorting them as an honor guard. So that's the story I wanted to tell you. That is a little snippet, a little slice or a glimpse into the way that things ought to be. Not how they've always been. Indeed, that's precisely why those three elder venerable chassidim were terrified because it was such an aberration from the historically established routine. But that's the way it ought to be. And in fact, that's the way that it was conceived in its original inception. Conceived, no pun intended, or maybe pun intended, I guess. When Rivka was pregnant, she went and she asked about why she's experiencing a battle within her womb. And she was told that there's not just two children, there are two nations. Yankov and Esav represent the Jewish people and Western civilization, respectively. Yankiv is the Jewish people, and Esav is Edom or Rome, Western civilization, which continues even till this day. So she was told there are two Goyim, Goyim is nations, not just two people, two peoples. And the word Goyim is spelled, so it could also be what Rashi points it out there, Geyim, which means exalted ones. And Rashi points out, well, why the double meaning? He says, because it's also a reference to the historical personalities of Rebbe and Antoninus. Two exalted ones are Rebbe and Antoninus. Rebbe was the leader of the Jewish people in his day. He was the redactor of the Mishnah following the Second Temple period. Antoninus was a philo-Semitic Roman emperor, a lover of the Jews, and he was a personal friend of Rebbe. They were friends. They respected each other. So in its conception, meaning how it began, at least in theory, Yankov and Esav were meant to have a symbiotic relationship like Rebbe and Antoninus. In fact, the Chassam Seifer says that Rebbe and Antoninus were the norm that it was supposed to be 
and that ideally Yankiv and Esav, the Jewish people in Western civilization, should have had a relationship similar to a Yesacher and Zvulun partnership. Yeah, like in the 12 tribes, two of the 12 tribes, you have Yesacher and Zvulun. Yesacher studies Torah and Zvulun goes out and does, uh, does the commerce in order to support the Torah study of, of Yesacher. So initially it was supposed to be that the Jewish people are occupied as scholars in spiritual wisdom and Rome, Western civilization, which is really good at technology and invention and, in, in, and industry, they would provide the support, the infrastructure, the material support for the spiritual uh, endeavors of the Jewish people. And that's how it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be like a Rebbe and Antoninus relationship. Now, the reality is that there's been a few thousand years of aberration where it hasn't been the way it's supposed to be. But at a moment like 1991, that Shabbos in Moscow, at the regional European Knesset Shluchim, you had a glimpse of the way it is supposed to be. You have the Shluchim proudly marching to Shul on a Shabbos, and you have the Russian police acting as the honor guard. That is a representation, that's an archetype of how the relationship is appropriately supposed to be. And in fact, there's a little more to the story. Just, a, just kind of delicious irony. Rabbi Kalarski mentioned to me that when they actually got back to the hotel, where did they put them to have their meeting where they're gonna, sp they're gonna plan how to spread godliness all over, the, all over Europe? They were placed in the Lenin Communist Party room. <laughs> and they sat in that room and they planned all the activities the shluchim are going to do in Europe to spread godliness throughout the continent that year. So, but, but, but the point is, everything that Western civilization has created, all the infrastructure, whether it's military might or it's technological advancement or industry, it's all really there to act as material support for the spiritual endeavors of the Jewish people. And that's the way the relationship's really supposed to be. So, really, that is the way, it's, the, the, the way that, they, that it ought to be. And in fact, you know, there's a song we sing after Havdalah on Saturday night, after Shabbos. Al-Tira Avdi Yankiv, do not fear my servant Jacob. One of the lines of that song goes according to the Aleph base, but the tough line is to say, Titan emes liyankiv, give truth to Yankiv, which is a, a verse from uh, the prophet, from Titan emes liyankiv chesed lavram. But there's a deeper meaning. Sudas malava malka, the meal after Shabbos, is Sudas David Malka Mashiach. It's the, it's, the, it's the meal of King David the Messiah, or the the forebearer of the Messiah. It's, there's a connection between Malava Malka and Mashiach, which is also why it sustains the Etzim Luz, the Luz bone, which is the, the source of Trias Amesim, resurrection. At any rate, so at that meal where we have our sights set on Mashiach, we say, Titan Emes Liankiv, give truth to Yankiv. What does that mean? Don't make Jacob a liar. Jacob told Esau, we're going to meet at Harseir when Mashiach comes. Make Yankiv good on his promise. Make sure that he makes good on his promise. In other words, what does that mean? We're saying, make sure, we're saying to Hashem, that Yankiv and Esav, the, the Jewish world and Western civilization, can finally enjoy the proper, appropriate relationship that they were always meant to have. A Rebbe and Antoninus type relationship. Now we can answer our question. What is the instruction to us when the non-Jew says, where are you heading? And we don't tell them our immediate destination on our itinerary. We tell them our ultimate destination on our itinerary. What does that mean? It means when they ask us, what's your agenda? What are you driving at? What, what, what did you come here for? What do you want? Why, you know, you're living in our country. What, what are you guys all about? Don't tell them some PC answer about immediate goals. Well, we're here for religious freedom. We're here for some security. We're here for... Tell them the truth. Tell them the ultimate destination. You want to know what we're here for? You know what we're driving at? Our ultimate place where we're going to meet up with you? A perfected world. Mashiach. Where there will be peace, 
among all humankind, and especially there will be this unique relationship between Western civilization and, and the Jewish people. And we should state it proudly and transparently and openly. That is the instruction for us in our day, even in our day and especially in our day when we're so close to Mashiach.